Hello and welcome to the Joe Avery Show. Coming up, we catch up with the Backstreet Theatre clan, Simon Pullum, Lachlan Pickering and Julian Gaskell, who are here to talk about their show, The Battling Butlers, which will be running at the Minack Theatre from the 14th to the 18th of May. Plus, Madison Lee joins us to talk about her music and her latest EP, Red Room Part 1. But first, let's hear about the news of the week. Well, hello guys, welcome to the show. I I hope you're well, having a good time, having a good uh, bank holiday weekend, of course, due to uh, the King's coronation. It was lovely, wasn't it, to see all of that pageantry and all of the royals out in force, um, lots of famous people and... You know, according to Twitter, good old uh, Penny Morden uh, was sort of the the star of the show, I suppose, which was maybe a a little bit surprising. Um, But there you go. I hope you're having a wonderful uh, extended weekend, whether, you know, you've gone up to London to join in the celebrations, maybe you're having a quiet one, or maybe you're enjoying time with uh, friends and family. Whatever you're doing, um, I hope you're having uh, a wonderful, wonderful day. Um, We've got a really, really exciting show coming up for you. Uh, We've got more local theatre so we're going to be speaking to uh, the Bass Street people about their show that they've got going on at the Minack Theatre at the moment. We've also got uh, Madison Lee who is from Liverpool, she's a brand new uh, music artist, she's just released her new EP um, which is really really good, it's called Red Room uh, Part 1, we'll be hearing from her later. Uh, which will be really, really exciting. We've got some great guests on the show this week and some great ones coming up. No thanks, but no thanks uh, this week. But if you do want to support the show, uh, then do please check out the links in the description below. Uh, You can press the support show link to make a monthly donation of your choosing to the show. And alternatively, you can press the Buy Joe a Coffee link, and that's going to enable you to make a one-off donation. uh, And it will be an amount of your choice uh, to the show. Um, And all proceeds collected from this will go towards improving and supporting the show. So, yeah, it would be really, really great uh, if you guys uh, could get involved in this. Um, And, yeah, hopefully I'll see you next week for uh, some more Thanks But No Thanks. Joey Bree. Still to come, I catch up with Madison Lee to talk about her music and latest EP, Red Room Part 1. But first, it's time to catch up with the Bass Street clan who have a brand new show, The Battling Butlers running at the Minack Theatre from the 14th to the 18th of May. It's Simon Pullum, Lachlan Pickering and Julian Gaskell. Well, hello Simon Pullum, Lachlan Pickering. Great to have you with us. How are you doing and where in the world can we find you today? Well, uh, hello uh, Jerry. We're in Penzance right now at home, uh, but ready to um, start a a, a short tour with the and off to Scotland and then Glastonbury in the next coming weeks. You're all members of Bass Street Theatre. Uh, would you mind telling us a bit about the history of this theatre uh, and how each of you are involved? Uh, well, Simon, my dad, he and my mum, Jojo, they started it. Well, well they, they started doing street theatre together over 30 years ago. And... 1991, yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then Bass Street, is, I think, just had its 30th anniversary recently. Um, so they've been doing that for a very long time. And I, I'm 22 years or so for, since I was a kid. I grew up in the van with them every summer, going on to, yeah, going to all the crazy places they went to. Yeah. The theatre is based in Cornwall. However, you have toured shows across the world. Uh, what has this experience been like for you? Well, I'll start with that one. Uh, We actually did our first ever show back in 1991 in uh, Morley in Britain Um, because we happened to be uh, there at the time, but not necessarily knowing we were going to perform there, uh, myself and uh, Jojo. Um, And from that time, we were performing at Land's End at regular summer seasons. So we started the company in front you like um back at land's end for summers and we made contacts in france and found out that there were loads and loads of fantastic theater festivals so not just in france but throughout europe and we were lucky enough to make contact it was easier in those days to to get to get work to admit 
um, you sent off your publicity and then word of mouth would get you further bookings. And over the years, we've performed at over 20 European, uh, in 20 European countries, but also further afield to South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Hong Kong Cairo, yeah, Egypt. Yep. Uh, yeah. In fact, Lockie made his first performance, had his first performance as a stilt walker. Yep. In the Cairo Circus Festival. Yeah, and I believe that might, I might be incorrect about this. It, it's if, it, um, only slightly, I think that was 10 years ago this year, because I think I was 13. Well, Bass Street is bringing us a brand new show, The Battling Butlers. It is currently touring the UK and will be at the Minak Theatre from the 14th to the 18th of May, 2023. What can you tell us about this show and who do you play or how are you involved? I play Joe Butler and Lockie here plays Joey Butler, my son. And it is very autobiographical because it's about a father and son double act who have been uh, performing in Europe. And, and doing street theatre and going on tour for most of for, for all of my character's life. And end up in the UK because of Brexit, no longer be able being able to tour in uh, in Europe anymore. And it's a functional story about them um, as as my character gets older throughout the show and how 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 their relationship evolves and degrades and evolves again throughout all of that. And Julian plays the music. Yes. So within this show, uh, there are a lot of circus uh, and magic tricks. Obviously, uh, some of these stunts must be pretty hard to learn. Uh, how did you master these skills and uh, how much do you enjoy performing them in front of an audience? <laughs> well, when it comes to stunts, in this particular show, um, unlike a lot of Bashi shows, we've actually got less of the the larger spectacle stunts. We've got some fantastic magic tricks that... Um, some of which are quite physically exerting and relatively difficult to do. But um, we we yeah. uh, have one sequence where I'm on stilts and Lachlan here is um, my puppet. We have another sequence where we're both on five unicycles on a quite a form a small platform, and the end of the show involves two sort of magic illusions. Very good. Um, so, Julian, uh, you, you wrote the original music yeah. uh, and Simon, you helped uh, with the lyrics. Uh, how did you both find yeah. this experience and how do the songs add to the show? It was a lot of fun. So um, Simon wrote, basically, most of them, Simon, had written, you wrote the words, didn't you? And I just uh. got away and came up with stuff. <laughs> he, he just came up with stuff. It's amazing. I've never written any words to a song before. And um, I gave them to Julian, and he then brings them to life with different musical styles, I think. But we did have a, a few uh, work workshop days before we even like started rehearsing, where we where we really did focus on the music. And like I, I think the fallacy for, for uh, the difficulty for us was because we're not singers, really, um, and we haven't had much of just doing that, was trying to... Um, learn the songs to a level where we felt <laughs> going into rehearsals was one of the biggest ones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we started doing that before we did the um, the rest of the show, didn't we? So, yeah. So the songs were all written and mostly learned and stuff before we started rehearsing. I suppose with um, in terms of writing the music with, with this stuff, because cause I've been working with these guys for years and we, we have a certain style of doing things that's from I'm from us doing silent movie sort of stuff and the sort of music I do is very old old timey and that's what we've always gone towards which is obviously very popular in the theatre world you know things with recordings on you know classical music that sort of stuff I mean I would I was deliberately starting off all the songs going way away from that just as far away as I could uh, because knowing that as soon as we started rehearsing it would veer back towards what we do by default because that's what works in a theatrical setting so <laughs> so yeah some of the some of them were a bit weird and i produced them on the computer and then threw the words on them and so, some of those ones changed quite a bit and some of them didn't you know so it's, it's hopefully it's a mix it's a good mixed bag I tried to get yeah. some characters in there didn't we but initially when i gave you the the, the lyrics you 
decided fairly soon to play it either on the accordion or the piano or guitar, depending yeah. on what style of uh, and the, the, the lyrics were. So um, that came together really quite quite easily. We love the music that he produces anyway. So uh. <laughs> <laughs> it was always an idea, you know, because we've got because because the show goes through the different phases of um, Joey's growing up really doesn't it so we wanted to try and have different um different things for that so the like the uh, the electric guitar cut for this droppy teenager and that sort of thing you know that so uh, yeah and then the old timey piano at the end but obviously we but when we put that all together in the show it it's not quite as strict as that because it's very very hard to sort of maintain that but it's still got that sort of thing i think hasn't it where each each phase each act has got its own kind of musical style hasn't it you know from yeah. the nice relaxing 50 jazz campfire in the first bit and then a bit more jolly accordion french style and then some pretty angry electric bluesy sort of stuff and then a complete mix of everything at the end brilliant so obviously uh you've all been working on this show for for quite a while now um and i'm aware you know some of you are related uh how have you found working together and do you have any funny stories or anecdotes from your time working on this show together. <laughs> Some yeah, of us are related, yeah. Julian's just thought of a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just... uh, yeah, never, never work with 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 people who are in who are families. Never work with uh, <laughs> sons or siblings. That's or what you get from children. Yeah, you know. That, that's what that's what the shows are about. We come to the conclusion you should never work with. <laughs> members of your family no but, but it really has been a joy to work with my young son and with Julian and it, the whole process has come together really really easily and I think because we get on so well and respect what each other does the the success of the show so far has come about because I hope and I think that we uh, give off the fact, give out the fact that we really enjoy doing the show and that comes across in performance. And if things are always going wrong because it's quite a technical show and there's loads of things that can go, but it doesn't really matter because we, we just have a good time. And hopefully that will give a, a level of authenticity that perhaps two other performers who aren't related be able to do, but you never know. <laughs> And things have gone wrong in the show. Well, um, I've got a collapsing uh, trick cane, um, walking stick cane that um, uh, was, I'm supposed to and usually do make appear from my my hand, and there it is. But it, it miraculously um, spat out of my pocket a couple of shows ago and nearly hit Julian in, <laughs> in in the face, <laughs> and. Um, what else? Well, yeah, I've, I've, we've both fallen off our unicycles a couple of times. These we have very large five foot unicycles without uh, injuring the audience. We can yeah. safely say. And um, the um, well, the baby, the baby, um, the baby Joey Lockie, um, I had this <laughs> on the podcast. Pissed all over my piano, didn't he? The other last. Show. <laughs> <laughs> he did indeed. Weed the, the all over the piano. Sorry, let's say that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you know, I take these things in my stride. I'm, I'm used to it. Well. So, yeah. The baby uh, Joey is supposed to uh, pee in my face, uh, <laughs> and he missed my face, and it did go all over the piano. The last show. <laughs> I think it's an example of professionalism. That is my protection. Well, and he, he didn't. He didn't miss a note. I just like to clarify: this wasn't actually me. I'm backstage at this point. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's very convincing, baby. We, we, we were determined to have a lot of fun, weren't we, when we were putting it together and rehearsing. We made we made a point of saying every day we're going to have fun. Because it can be quite tough. It's quite, whilst it is great fun putting these things together, it's quite, it's, um, it can be quite stressful, can't it? Because you've got, you've, got you've got to have a show and it's got to be 90 minutes long and you start off with very sketchy ideas and you put it all together and you're in a cold rehearsal room in January or whatever it was and you know this is like is this yeah yeah there were so, definitely but we remember that I think it was a Wednesday 
that me and Simon, uh, it, it was it, it wasn't that the, the day went terrible, but it was during the period where we were starting to do a run through at the end of each day to kind of consolidate what we we're all doing. There was one Wednesday where we both completely separately from each other just ended finished the day in pure depression, <laughs> being like we'd created the worst show we'd ever done. Um, <laughs> And yeah, you, you, it was always, a dark day. It was it? a truly <laughs> dark day, but it, it, for some reason, it, that day happened to be like that. The next day, everything was fine again. It wasn't even that we changed that much. It was just sometimes, yeah, it is a stressful experience occasionally. You're right. Well, we do all put everything into it, um, and it's it, <laughs> it is what we do. Yeah, yeah. And I said. Definitely, I don't know. For, I can't speak for you two, but it's if the the response we've had so far for this show does seem to be. I mean, it's been you know you don't. I'm not saying it's been bad for other shows, but it definitely seems to be yeah. a step up from the other shows we've done recently, and that people really get it. They really that the story is really touching for people, and it's really clearly told. And you know, it seems to just works, doesn't it? Absolutely, it seems to like fact that we are real father and son and the emotion of that comes out mm. and they love the music and the songs as i said i was so uh anxious about having never written any words um do add to the story and people genuinely like like musicals uh one thing we love to ask our guests is how they found life during the lockdowns Obviously, it was a difficult time for many performers, uh, but did you use it as a time to rest and kind of recharge your batteries, uh, or did you guys get busy? Julian? It's a different answer for me than it'll be for you two, won't it? Because actually, yeah. funnily enough, I hadn't worked with these guys for many years. Um, Lockie here had, had taken over my job playing the piano and he's been doing uh, for, for, in, in fine style and whatever. And, and um, it was actually during lockdown I bumped into you, wasn't it? And then um, we talked about, you know, and that's maybe what led to us working together again on the camera. But so for obviously my experience is different from theirs, but I, as a musician, I, I was uh, suddenly not working very much. But I'm busy with other things. I was teaching, teaching on college Zoom. I was looking after my two young children, et cetera, et cetera. So I didn't, I didn't have a very relaxing time. But it was all right, you know. I got I was lucky; nothing terrible happened, and uh, we muddled through. And yeah, that's that's me. But obviously, it's different for you two because you were in the middle of doing a show, weren't you? <laughs> well, funny you should mention that there was a fateful journey as as just before the lockdown happened, and as we started, everyone everyone in the UK started becoming more and more aware of COVID. And I remember originally, like me and my friends, we'd be joking a bit like thinking it was going to be a passing thing that was going to disappear in a couple of weeks um but we had a, a gig that we were meant to do in turkey um and dad simon would have had to drive for many days in him on his own in the in in our big blue van all the way to turkey we'd then fly out and do the show and then he'd we'd fly back and he'd slowly drive back and as COVID, and as we, as we started to see certain countries start locking down and start having quarantines, he was he had to, he felt so bad that and and he's because he's cancelling gigs, so he he made the correct decision to cancel and then spent the next three weeks like agonising and looking at the the reports, checking to see whether he could have gotten away with it. Well, we had to drive through Italy and then Greece. That was the plan, and then Italy got locked down. And he said, oh, well, we could drive through uh, Germany, um, Romania, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then Germany got shut down. Um, so that was the initial lockdown period. I have to uh, add that we didn't actually meet Julian during lockdown because <laughs> that was highly illegal. So it was, it was around that time. Um, but what we did do, Joe, in, in, in lockdown, because... Jo Jojo, my wife, was in the show, a previous show, myself and Lachlan. We did, in our family bubble, rehearse an old show. Um, and as soon as lockdown finished in the, the first period, of it, anyway, in July of that mm -hmm. year, Minak Theatre, where we're playing in a couple of weeks, uh, wanted to open, but they had no they had no acts because all their acts had been cancelled. And and the first time in many, many years, uh, they were looking for very different shows because they didn't want an interval. They didn't want a long show. 
and we became perfect suddenly for the Minak Theatre. <laughs> so as soon as lockdown w- w- was over, we went we, back. We were one of the first shows that were ready made to play at the Minak. And that was really because we were in a family bubble. Yeah. So that actually did us a lot of good because we then returned the following year to the Minak, missed last year. And as you said earlier, here again at the Minak, 14th to the 18th of May. Amazing. Brilliant. Oh, yeah, perfect. Like your outdoor shows, perfect for the for the Minak Theatre, and great that you were able to put a show on at such a tough time uh, for everyone, bring a bit of uh, light relief. We're just about out of time, but thank you so much for joining us. Before you go, do you have any socials or upcoming projects that you'd like to plug, Julian? Oh right, yeah. Well, oh yeah, I am. You can look me up, Julian Gaskell, on Instagram or Facebook or website luckily if you google my name you just get that i've got a show called broadside bangers which is um broadside ballad material from the 19th century and older done in fine style for the modern audience um yeah there you go <laughs> touring near you in fact we hope hopefully we'll act with that next year and at penley park and places like that as well so we kind of we've done we did a few shots to me and my band the ragged trousered philanthropists um yeah so Next year at the Minac, but we'll be around somewhere in Cornwall before that, probably. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. They're fantastic. They are indeed. And for Battling Butler, obviously we're at the Minac in, uh, in next week, starting on Sunday the 14th. We've also got Penley Park on the 5th of July. We've got Plenanguari in St. Just for La Fraude on the 12th of July, Carmarth Amphitheatre on the 14th of July, and Carnden and Wood in Bodmin on the 15th of July. And yeah, it's going to be a packed summer. We're also going to be at Glastonbury. Yeah, we are for Glastonbury. <laughs> <laughs> and beautiful days. And beautiful, beautiful days. days. Yeah. Indeed, in August. Cool, brilliant. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me and see you soon. Good luck. I don't know how you're going to edit all that together, but good <laughs> luck. <laughs> Joey Bree. Thank you so much, Simon Pullum, Lachlan Pickering and Julian Gaskell. A reminder that the Battling Butlers will be running at the Minac Theatre from the 13th to the 18th of May. You can get your tickets now by following the link in the description. Up next, I talk to a very talented singer-songwriter from Liverpool. She has a brand new EP out called Red Room Part 1 and her name is Madison Lee. Well, hello Madison Lee. Thanks so much for joining us today. How are you and where in the world can we find you? Hi, oh, thank you for having me. Um, well, I'm from, well, I'm Madison Lee and I'm from Liverpool in the UK. Brilliant. So you're a singer songwriter uh, and you have your debut EP, Red Room Part One, which is just out now. And we're going to talk a bit more about it later. Uh, what is it about music that you love and how did you come to enter this industry? Um, it's always been an outlet for me. I've just always just enjoyed enjoyed performing arts in general, but I've always um, been drawn to singing from a very young age. You know, always getting up on karaoke and you know just always took an interest in it, even like from when I was young, very young, about like seven or eight, and I was obsessed with Pop Idol, and I actually begged my mum for the Pop Idol like mic and stand. Um, and she obviously liked bought me. She's always been very supportive. Um, but yeah, so from a very early age. Very good. And uh, growing up, who were some of the musicians that you love to listen to? And uh, have you taken any influences from these people when producing your own music? Um, yeah, from a very early age, um, my mum was like a big fan of um, Amy Winehouse when she first came out in 2003. And obviously being so young, because it was a jazz album, I was like, uh, like what, what type of music is this? Um, and then it wasn't until like a few years later when I was in, in high school that I took a really big interest in it. Um, so Amy Winehouse is one. And then I took a um, liking to Duffy too. Um, so Amy Winehouse, Duffy. And then as, I was obvious, as I've obviously got older, um, Lana Del Rey, she's a big inspiration too and as of recently Sade as well I've been listening to a lot of Sade so I take you know influences from each of those artists um yeah 
Uh, you studied music at university. Uh, how did this positively influence your career as a musician? And would you recommend it to younger people who have an interest in music and this industry? Yeah, it helped me a lot because um, when I was at school, I didn't study music. Um, it was dance because, um, yeah, it, weirdly enough, yeah, it was dance that I studied. So it wasn't until I finished school and then I went to college, studied music there and then obviously went to university and I didn't have no background within music theory or even writing songs and it, it just really helped me a lot even with vocal warm-ups vocal techniques and um, other people were pretty advanced because they were way like they were you know having music lessons from a very young age so some people didn't really feel like they needed it we at the, when I was studying there, I just, I loved it and I felt it was very educational and I would, I would recommend, I'd recommend it to like anyone if you feel like you, you want to even study about it because, you know, the music history lessons are very um, educational too and I felt like I benefited a lot from it and I enjoyed my time at university too. It helped me connect with other musicians and I um, started to write music with other musicians too um, and that's how it helped me write and release my first single in of I read the lyrics and then someone like writes the chords and stuff so it helps you in you know if you want to write your own music too when you connect with um, other musicians. Brilliant and obviously as stated before uh, you've just released your EP Red Room Part One. Uh, what can you tell us about this EP and what was the inspiration behind it? Um. So I started writing music in 2015. So the, the in one of the songs, Midnight, was the earliest song that I'd written. And and then in 2017, Last Resort was the very first song that I released. So since 2017, it's been a very long journey. Um, lots of setbacks, you know, um, obviously trial and error, working with different um, sound engineers and being really fussy and um, should say perfectionist with how I wanted it to sound then obviously um, so ever since I released my first single in 2017 I was always like oh I'm going to release EP this year and then it was the next year the next year until the pandemic hit and I was like oh where do we go now because the musicians that I was previously working with they were in, they then obviously had other projects going on and so on so it was kind of like left and I was like oh what am I going to do so that's when I started working with beats. So let me go and pray or in beats that I licensed out. And I just listened to them and wrote a song to them. Um, obviously from how I write my lyrics, I write them in, I'll get obviously the lyrics and the melody, and then I'll take that to someone and they'll write the chords to it. But in this case, I was just listening to in you know just different type beats say for instance with prey i know i wanted to well i've always been obsessed with in the temptations and most time and i knew in one of the singles for the ep i wanted to write like a soul type song so i just typed in you know soul type beat and then i came across in the beat that is prey and then just read a song to it <laughs> weirdly and it which is um i i enjoy doing now in that process and writing but the inspiration comes from all personal experiences too that have been in you know the all about past relationships or situationships that I've been in and where people obviously write in a diary I write music and it's just such a big um, an emotional outlet for me and yeah so and obviously the title comes from um, Twin Peaks by David Lynch in David Lynch is obviously a big inspiration. Well, he inspires me a lot aesthetic-wise. Um, I'm just, I've, I've just been obsessed for a bit, for a good few years. So I wanted to um, incorporate in the EP, um, obviously, the, um, Twin Peaks. So that's why I called it Red Room Part One. So it's like a series. And then obviously the second EP will be Red Room Part 2. And at the back of the physical, it's got like episode one, episode two, just set, and I've arranged it so it tells the story. 
Very good. Uh, you've talked in the past about wanting to be sort of free in your creativity and not wanting to be limited uh, to one specific genre of music. Uh, how has this choice liberated you personally and has it ever presented mm -hmm. any challenges? Not as not as of yet. Well, I'd say like the one slight challenge is say like if you were, you're applying for festivals or when you put your music form for radio stations and like, oh, what genre are you? And I'm just like, uh, so sometimes I, the closest is alternative because it's an array of genres. Um, it's just whatever, um, whatever type of new song, like, that I'm feeling at the time because I listen to a lot of music. I listen to R and B, soul, in pop, rock, indie, alternative. So I kind of like to, you know, adult, like I say, don't want to pigeonhole myself and be like, oh, I'm just this one genre. It's just whatever, whatever I'm feeling creatively at the time. Where the type of music, obviously, that I'm enjoying writing at the moment is soul, and I'm even going down like seventies, like funk type at the moment for the second EP. But yeah, so. It's just the yeah it is kind of you know liberating to be able to just venture into other genres instead of just being just one type so in um, the listener you know they're like oh I wasn't expecting that and you know it just you know keeps it exciting <laughs> indeed and so within this EP would you say the songs are definitely a mix of different sort of genres and styles and influences uh, or do they hold some form of cohesion as a as a collection? Um, I'd say some of the songs, so like um, Last Resort, The Damage Is Done and I Love You, were around like the same type of like period. So I think it was just like, say, you know, emotionally how I was feeling and in basically what I was listening to at the time, which was say, you know, Lana Del Rey and um, Adele. So I think you subconsciously kind of go towards that um, genre. But even with the um, damage is done, I that the idea that I have for that was a um, bond type vibe, bond type like theme. Um, but yeah, it was that was like the vibe at the time was you know key strings, and I probably you know will probably go go back to that. But at the moment, I'm enjoying the upbeat soul type um, type genre. But yeah, yeah. Very good. Uh, making music is very much a collaborative process. Uh, who are some of the people you've collaborated with on this EP uh, and how has that process worked? Um, so, well, a few of them were students at my old university. Um, yeah, a few people. Well, majority, everyone, apart from two songs. So, um, Last Resort, I Love You, um, the damage is done midnight. Those four, I think. Or I think it was five. I can't remember. Yeah, there's about well, think five of them were um, collaborations of um, musicians from in um, my old university. And then pray and let me go with beats that I licensed out. Very good. Uh, and do you have any funny stories or anecdotes from your time uh, working with these people? I wouldn't say funny times. I'd say stressful times. <laughs> I was very, um, yeah, I feel like I've come a long way since um, since 2017. It has been a, like literally a roller coaster of journeys and finding myself really as an artist. And I'm very happy where I am in the position that I'm in now and I feel like I say more free and independent that I'm doing everything I, I it was scary at the time um going back into 2020 when I was like oh what I'm, you know I need to start creating music again and then obviously finding out like that coming across beats and knowing that now creatively I'm able to write to them um than just obviously writing with someone else so very good. So you've got new finished music and essentially it's ready for release. Uh, what is going to be your sort of approach to promoting your, your work and future works? Um, all my, my promotion that I do is like mainly online. But with obviously this, um, probably just, I'm looking more creatively at doing more music videos. So I've currently got plans to, well, I'm still, as I'm still promoting, in Red Room Part 1, 
I'm planning a music video for Prey. Um, so hopefully that'll help with the promotion more and I'm sending them to playlists. So just really social media wise and obviously reaching out to people. But I wanna I've got two gigs um lined up that I've not announced yet. One's HMV and one's in the cavern. These are in June. Very good. And obviously now your music's out there in the world. Uh, how do you feel when you hear one of your songs played on the radio or, or other form, forms of media? Um, it's so crazy. And, you know, just like hearing, you know, your song that you've you know, been creating for like months and then you're like, oh, like and especially like people's kind words as well. Um, you know, what you've got to say about it. Yeah, it's just very surreal, really, but exciting too. So we've talked a lot today about your kind of recorded music, uh, but what does performing live uh, mean to you? Um, and obviously you've, you've spoken a bit about some live performances uh, coming up in June, um, but do you have any other uh, dates planned and, and uh, any future um, ideas about potential live music that uh, listeners and, and fans might be interested in hearing about? Um, just, uh, currently, it is just those two gigs that I've mentioned. Um, but yeah, so I just have to obviously see, um, you know, what, what else is to come really. But I absolutely love performing live and I was at a stage where I disliked recording music because I felt like it wasn't going right until I recorded Prey. Um, that just helped restore my faith in enjoying recording music again. But I absolutely love performing live because um, I was... I've, um, like last year, um, the, to, like the end of last year, I was attending um, open mic night at the Cavern, well, it's the Cavern Pub, and that just helped a lot, you know, helped with my confidence because I hadn't performed for a while, and I was getting a lot of, you know, positive feedback, so um, I was at going there every Monday, I really enjoyed, um, enjoyed performing there live, but yeah, I just found it, like I say, it's just a big outlet for me. And yeah, I just, just love performing that. Really enjoy it. Very good. One thing we love to ask all of our guests about is how they found life during the lockdown. Did you spend it relaxing and having a bit of a break or, or did you get quite busy? Um, I relaxed most of it. And I thought it did, like not going to lie, it affected my mental health. The, the first lockdown in 2020, um, yeah, that that was a lot. That was a big healing process for me. Um, so creative, creatively, no, I was, wasn't creative at all. But then in 2020 lockdown, I was a lot more creative, and that's how I, that's when I wrote "Let Me Go." And I actually um, purchased a lot of home studio way. I did try and record vocals um, for "Let Me Go" because I, I was thinking, "Oh, this is easy. I can do this myself." And then I was just like, "No, it just wasn't going right." And then I had all like this, um, all, all this studio equipment that I just didn't need. And then um, I eventually um, went into the studio like last year to record it. Um, right, we're just about out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Madison, for joining us today. Uh, before you go, do you have any socials or other projects that you'd like to plug? Uh, and what are your hopes for the future? Um, the hopes of the future are to be, you know, a very successful singer songwriter and you know to be in on the full time living from it, you know, tour the world, perform, you know, on some big festival stages and just enjoying life in in the industry. Um I don't currently have anything to promote other than <laughs> my EP Red Room um, part one is on all major streaming sites and um, my Instagram is Madison Lee UK. The same is for my Twitter and my Facebook is Madison Lee fans. You have to for it to come up. That's Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Madison, and see you soon. Oh no, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. Joey Bree. A big thank you to all of my guests and to you guys for joining me today on the Joe Avery Show. 
have you clicked that follow button on all of our socials? If not, you're missing out. Just look up at The Joe Avery Show on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Also, a reminder that you can support the show by clicking the support show and buy Joe a coffee link in the descriptions down below. Catch you soon.